Bonsoir, mesdames, messieurs. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for attending this public consultation meeting on draft bylaw 2596, le projet particulier de construction, de modification ou d'occupation d'un immeuble, also known as PPC-1. Today is Monday, June 20th, 2022. This meeting is being video recorded in the council chamber of the city of Côte saint luc Quebec. Je m'appelle Tania Abramovic, je suis la directrice générale associée et je vais présenter les intervenants et expliquer le déroulement de l'Assemblée. The objective of this session is to provide you with information on bylaw 2596 and to answer your questions. The session is scheduled from 7 p.m. ish to 8 p.m. or so. Voici l'ordre de jour de cette Assemblée de consultation. Nous commencerons par le discours d'ouverture du maire Mitchell Brownstein, suivi des remarques du modérateur de cette assemblée, le conseiller Mitch Kujawski, qui a le portfolio de l'aménagement urbain. Ensuite, il y aura une présentation de Melanie Rothman de la division d'aménagement urbain et enfin une période de questions et réponses. In addition to the persons mentioned, we are also joined live by the director of urban development, Charles Senecal, and virtually by other members of the city council. The public will be able to ask questions in three ways. First, those in attendance in the council chamber can ask question at the microphone. Those not able to be inside this room due to the 50 person limit will be able to enter the room to ask their question. Questions must be a maximum of two minutes and we ask that you keep preambles as short as possible to enable others to have a turn. The second way to ask a question is with Zoom webinar app. Simply press the Q&A button and type your question. The third way to ask a question is by pressing the raise hand button in Zoom. When it's your turn, we will prompt you to unmute your microphone and you can ask your question. Nous ferons de notre mieux pour répondre à un maximum de questions tout au long de la session. Nous vous demandons de rester respectueux dans vos questions et votre comportement. Faites en sorte que vos questions soient courtes et claires. Nous modérerons les questions tapées dans Zoom et afficherons et lirons toutes les questions à l'exception de celles contenant des remarques méprisantes. Again, we will try our best to get to as many questions as possible. We ask that you remain respectful in your questions and your demeanor. Please make sure your questions are short and clear. We will be moderating the questions typed in Zoom and will post and read all the questions except those containing derogatory remarks. This meeting is being video recorded and will be posted at CoteStLuke.org slash engage this week. This ends the preliminary remarks. I will now ask Mayor Mitchell Brownstein to make introductory remarks. Bonsoir, merci tout le monde. Mais vous êtes bienvenue et merci pour être avec nous ce soir. Thank you for being here tonight and also to all those watching on Zoom. I think we have over 125 participants that have chosen to participate on Zoom. And we are uh, really pleased that you're all with us virtually or in presence. Um, you know, first of all, I came to Cote St. Luke in 1964. I was a little kid. I was a member of the Tefereth Beth David Jerusalem Synagogue. I grew up on Borden, two houses over from a good friend, Armand Moyal, who still lives, I think, two houses next to my mom, who lives on that street still. Um, when I got my, I had my bar mitzvah there, when I grew up, I went, I became a member of the, um, Congregation Beth Israel Beth Aaron and got married there and had my kids bar mitzvahs there. My um, daughter had her uh, bat mitzvah at Shara Zion. It's been a wonderful life in Cote St. Luke since a very young age. And uh, I'm very proud to be a member of this community, a community that at the present time has a mayor who's Jewish and all the councillors who are Jewish, some more observant than others, but we all share the same values. I also value the uh, contributions of members who are not part of the Jewish community and um, a good friend of former city councillor Joe Panuto, who's uh, very involved with uh, the Italian community and with St. Richard's Church. Now, based on our common values, I could say, you know, I was brought up, whether it was in a, from Jewish day school, from my kids going to Jewish day school, that we're here as individuals who are supposed to be an example to the world, and we are, of the ethical behavior that we um, do of justice, kindness, truth, peace, and respect of the sanctity of life, ensuring that one life saved is saving the world. And what we're trying to do today 
is just a small part of a process. We have in our city today, 17 congregations, 17 in terms of Jewish congregations, the Jewish congregation, 17 of them. And each one provides a very important service to their community, not only religious, but also community. It's a center focal point for the members of those congregations. And we value them each. And we know that the city of Côte St. Luke benefits from the partnership that we have with those congregations. Et on sait dans le futur, on va avoir des autres qui sont bienvenus. Mais on doit trouver un moyen pour les accueillir d'une façon que tout le monde, toute la population de la ville de Côte Saint Luc, peut les accepter, peut les embrasser comme une importante partie de notre communauté. Since becoming mayor, uh, about six years ago, there have been um, many more. We had about three or four before that, and many more have come to the community in the six years since I've been mayor and moved into residential zones. So I think we have right now 13 that are legally zoned and five or six that are in residential zones. When I became mayor, there were two that were in residential zones that since then have moved to commercial zones. And we as a city added a religious use by passing a bylaw that was subject to register and referendum for uh, Westminster above Adar for the Bells community to be legal there. We have Rabbi Yesharum who moved from Einstein in a house to Codwell uh, also uh, to conform. So I think we can see that the discussion has uh, had some effect in terms of two congregations on their own finding ways to accommodate the community. And I, I thank them for that. I'm not saying everyone can do that. So that's why we're here today to discuss the PPC MOI bylaw to see what that can do to help. It's an opportunity. It's an opportunity that can help. It's not the be all and end all. There are more things that the city is doing. I have met with most of the congregations, with the rabbis, and I continue to meet with Councilor Ben Isri, with each and every congregation to understand their concerns and their needs, to see what we can do to do better. There is a master plan that we're moving forward in and we're gonna be redeveloping our malls. We wanna ensure that we have religious use available in those spaces as well. Et on va trouver des autres places dans les immeubles qui existent maintenant, où on peut ajouter uh, la possibilité d'exercice une congrégation dans ces immeubles qui existent aujourd'hui. So on fait le tout, et le PC et moi, c'est juste une partie de tout ce qu'on le fait pour trouver une une moyenne pour tout le monde d'avoir une ville où tout le monde vive ensemble et qu'on peut avoir une bonne qualité de vie. And it has to be one that we all can work with and live together. So tonight, I'm a mediator more than a, I'm a lawyer by profession, but I've always been a mediator and a negotiator more than a litigator. And what I've learned most is that you need to speak kindly with respect, have your ears open and listen to others. We're not gonna agree on everything that's uh, mentioned today. And the process is just one, as I said, one of the parts to an end result, but we will only accept respect tonight. Everybody has to speak kindly to each other. And if their questions are uh, constructive, they'll be received, but if they're not, they won't be tolerated. So. Please do your best to make this a fruitful discussion where we can all benefit and come one step closer to achieving what we want, which is a city of Cote St. Luke that is the desire of all to live in. And for the Jewish community, when the world is watching us, we do it right in a way that everybody can respect us for the way we act. And tonight will be an example of that for everybody. And they tell me, I, I tell you, they are watching, not just Cote St. Luke residents, the world is watching. So behave yourself tonight. Thank you. Oh, by the way, I just wanted to say, I'm going into my office, I can see everybody, not just you guys. I'm gonna go on my computer and I'm leaving the, the rest of the meeting to the specialists and to the chair of the uh, planning advisory, uh, urban planning.
Councilor Kajaski. So I'll be watching you on for my uh, Zoom. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you. So we are here today because the city has not done its job. For many years, we have made every effort to be a city of religious accommodation. Unfortunately, this eventually led to the city not enforcing its bylaws. This was unfair. This was unfair to residents living in residential zones. This was unfair to religious institutions who wanted nothing more than to provide a service to the community. And this was unfair to future city administrations who were left trying to find a fair solution for the situation we now find ourselves in. Comme les règles de zonage n'étaient pas appliquées, les institutions religieuses se sont installées dans des maisons et des duplex à côté d'autres maisons et duplex, et dans au moins un cas, un duplex séparé par un seul mur. Cela n'aurait jamais dû être autorisé. Cela dit, nous devrions tout pouvoir nous mettre d'accord sur les points principaux. Que les propriétaires ont le droit de jouir paisiblement de leur propriété, les institutions qui répondent à des besoins sociaux devraient avoir un endroit pour le faire, que les règles de zonage doivent répondre à ces besoins et que les violations des règles de zonage doivent être rapidement corrigées. The reason why this issue has taken so long to be addressed is because it's complicated. There are various points of view on how the city should resolve this issue. One point of view is that a strict reading of our bylaws requires the city to find an owner for illegal use and eventually close any institution operating from a residential zone. What complicates this, however, is that some of these institutions have been there for years and operated with the knowledge of the city. So how can a new city administration all of a sudden enforce its bylaws? Even if the city is allowed to do this, even if the law doesn't give these institutions acquired rights, this solution still feels problematic. Another point of view is to simply maintain the status quo. The city should simply allow the existing institutions to operate in residential zones, and one would assume allow any future institutions to open in other homes. After all, these are socially valuable and important services, so the city should make an exception. But this solution feels problematic too. How can the new city administration ignore zoning rules when that's what created strong negative feelings in the first place? The status quo cannot possibly be the answer. Another point of view is to have the city administration make all the existing locations institutional and enforce the zoning rules for any new ones that want to open up. The problem with this solution is that the city administration cannot do this on our own. We must follow the urban planning laws of Quebec, which make it clear that anything to do with rezoning must involve residents in the area. La solution que l'administration municipale a recherchée et choisie trouve un équilibre. La solution crée un, nou, un moyen légal pour les institutions religieuses de demander un usage institutionnel religieux dans une propriété résidentielle. Mais ce, ce n'est pas automatique. Comme pour tout raisonnage, les habitants de la zone concernée ont leur mot à dire. C'est ainsi que le processus fonctionne. Mais il est clair pour moi que si une institution a été consensueuse avec ses relations avec ses voisins, si elle a fait des efforts pour être un bon voisin, comme beaucoup l'ont fait, Alors, elle a créé les bases appropriées. Something else I'd like to mention. We have received many thoughtful letters written by people who were deeply concerned that these places of worship and study would be shut down with the PPC Moi bylaw. It's important for me to clarify the key purpose of the PPC Moi, so I will do so. This is to ensure that all of these buildings are structurally safe for all the people going there and that they have been legalized in terms of the use with social acceptability. We fully understand the multiple purposes these institutions fill and how indispensable they are for so many of you. We have also had many discussions with the leaders of these synagogues and they're of course on board with making their buildings safe. We don't doubt it for a second. As a city, however, we can't operate on individual comments of goodwill. We need a process and a bylaw to ensure that these measures are applied uniformly. 
During the course of this hour, we'll listen and we'll answer questions. I can't tell you how to ask your questions, but if you have strong feelings about the situation, please direct it at the city where it belongs, not at your neighbors. Au cours de cette heure, nous écouterons et nous répondrons aux questions. Je ne peux pas vous dire comment poser vos questions, mais si vous avez des sentiments forts à propos de la situation, veuillez les veuille adresser à la ville là où ils doivent être, pas à vos voisins. Lastly, you should all know that I am personally committed, as is the mayor, council, and city staff, to finding long-term solutions and compromises that work for everyone. Enfin, sachez que je suis personnellement engagé, tout comme le maire, le conseil municipal, les employés de la ville, à trouver des solutions et des compromis à long terme qui conviennent à tout. Merci. And now, I'd like to introduce Urban Planning Coordinator, Melanie Rothman, who will explain the PPCMOA bylaw. Thank you. Hi, everyone. I will briefly present some technical components of the bylaw relating to its purpose, the application process, and the evaluation criteria. Je vais vous présenter quelques éléments techniques du règlement, le processus, et les critères d'évaluation. As many of you already know, the purpose of this bylaw is to allow the City Council to authorize a specific use within a building which is not currently permitted in the zoning bylaw. Specific criteria and conditions must be met and the approval process must follow the prescribed legal procedure. If adopted, this bylaw will apply to five zones in the city, which you can see in this map. As we zoom in, you can see that the gray area is the zone and the small red squares are the existing properties in question. Here you see zone, RU21 with the property on Leger and zone RB6 with the two properties on Eldridge. Here you see zone RB7 with the property on Parkhaven and zone RU32 with the property on Haywood. Finally, we see zone RU1 with the property on Bailey. It is important to understand that this process is not a zoning change. This is a bylaw to authorize a specific use within the current residential zone. Once this bylaw is approved, the urban planning department can begin to receive applications. For this application process, reasonable time will be given to each applicant in order for them to prepare all the required documents and studies. Étant donné que de nombreuses études et documents seront requis, nous accorderons un délai raisonnable pour le dépôt des demandes. The evaluation and approval process for each application is rigorous and many steps are involved. Note that for each application received by the city, there are several steps along the way where the public can provide feedback. These steps are identified with an asterisk in this chart. Le public aura nombreuses occasions de participer au cours de ce processus. The process is as follows. I'll go through with you a little bit. The applicant will gather all required documents, information, and applicable studies and submit their application to the urban planning department. Their submission will then be reviewed by the planning advisory committee who will provide their recommendations to the city council. The next step is for the council to adopt the first draft of the resolution during their public council meeting. Following that is the public consultation and then the adoption of the second draft resolution at a subsequent public council meeting. The final steps include the referendum process and the adoption of the resolution. It is very important, again, to make the distinction between the process we are in right now with the bylaw itself and the separate process that each applicant will go through after the bylaw is in force, which is what you see on the screen here. Finally, the assessment criteria includes code and safety requirements, compatibility of the use within the residential environment, and a demonstration that the project does not generate a significant increase in traffic. It is also important to ensure that the residential character of the building and the streetscape will be maintained. L'objectif est d'assurer la sécurité de tout et de maintenir le caractère résidentiel du quartier. Thank you, merci.
Okay, we're opening up for questions, yes? Okay, so we're gonna open up the floor, the real floor and virtual floor for our question and answer period. We'll, uh, okay, so uh, you have numbers, let's see number one. Hi. Hi. I wanted to deposit some documents. Did you, who should I give it to? I wanted to talk about the two the two um, properties on Eldridge. Hmm. I wanted, to, I wanted to talk about specifically, I had looked at the ownership of the properties and had noticed that it had changed hands a number of times. In 2010, the property was purchased by Yeshiva or Israel. In the next time in 2015, it was purchased by, um, by, uh, by Fondation de la Famille Nataf and Chaim Nataf together. And then in 2020, it was purchased by it was purchased by Aaron Lamel and Rebecca Shoshan. And finally in 2022, it was purchased by um, Chaim Nataf again himself. So I was just curious um, about why these properties, why these properties had changed hands so, so many times. And because it, it's it doesn't seem like it's a it's a stable, it's a stable place. Um, to have a have a synagogue. I'm going to ask. I'll ask my questions afterwards. Okay. Um, well, so but I mean, I could ask. This, um, no. So my first, my but my first question is regarding 5751 because you had mentioned before um, that that at least that you have to understand on Eldridge there's two properties that are in semi-detached duplexes, which means the, the duplex is attached. It's not one, it's actually, it's actually two and it's on, the same, it's on the same block. So it's quite crowded with, with synagogues. Um, so I'm curious, um, first of all, the, the, the synagogue located at 5751, is it a registered entity? Because I didn't find any. That I can't speak to. I'm not sure if there's a registered entity at 5751. Just to, I can, I can give you a relatively short answer to your first comment. So, I mean, I can't, I can't really comment on, on changes of ownership as mm -hmm. it were. I mean, these are financial issues that are handled by, by the city finance department. Um, properties turn over all the time. I mm -hmm. don't know if that's necessarily relevant to the discussion we're having here regarding the PPCMOI bylaw. Um, obviously, we all hope for stability in our residential re or Places our residential zone, but you know these things do happen, so I can't really comment further on it. Well, well, I think it. I think it is relevant um, because on on Eldridge, on on my street, there's there's synagogues, there's there's yeshivas, there's rabbis in residence, um, and and uh, and all of these have come up in the last in the last couple of years. But specifically, I wanted to ask you about the sale of the property in 2020, where. Um, where Mr. Aaron Lamel and Rebecca Shoshan purchased the property, um, and they because they live in a rabbi in residence across the street. So they li they live in a rabbi in residence across the street, um, and they purchased and they purchased a property um, for nine hundred a combined nine hundred and fifty thousand dollars. Okay, again, um, I'm not quite sure how. The curiosity you have is relevant to the discussion we're having on the PPCMOI. Mm -hmm. Again, this is about turnover and financial issues. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I'm not really sure there was a question. Well, well, I don't. I just don't. I, well, I don't understand why these why these why this building is changing hands so many times. Uh, and it it and the the building and they're also and I also don't understand. It doesn't seem like it's a like it's a legitimate synagogue that's going on there because they're constantly changing hands. It's not owned by, it's owned by individuals. It's not owned by, 
by a, a group run by a board of directors. Yeah, well, as the other synagogues, if you look at the synagogues on, on Park Haven, that's a legitimate synagogue. If you look at the synagogue on Haywood, those are legitimate synagogues. But here you have this situation where the property is constantly cha changing hands and it's owned by, and it was owned at one point, like I said, by, by a rabbi in residence across the street. Okay, again, my answer is the same. I, I really can't speak to turnover. We'll have to move on, I think, to the next question after this. But as, as mm -hmm. the urban planning coordinator Rothman said, we are aware and addressing the issues that relate to mm -hmm. the two properties on Eldridge um, that are in, I believe, the same zone, mm -hmm. correct? So that will be the zone that they will be eligible to apply for a PPCMO, make a PPCMO application. Um, yeah, as for the other issues, I mean, I invite you to, to follow up with me after we can speak with the mayor. We can have a meeting one on one if you like. But as for that, look, we want to stay focused on, uh, on the issue at hand today and financial right. issues and turnover of properties. I, mean, I think you'd agree these turnovers and flips happen all the time. They're mm -hmm. just on my street in Wentworth, there was a flip. There were three owners in, in one year, the one year I've been living at my new home. These happen all the time. Right. Well, I, I don't agree. I think they happen in res, in residential setting, but my I guess I guess I'll get to the point and I'll, I'm not going to talk to you for for an hour, but please feel free to to read the information. It's a good read. I'm sure you would enjoy it and learn something. Um, but because with all every time the building changes over every time the building changes hands it's run by volunteers. And that's where the that's where the problems the problems have come out the problems that of the garbage not being handled properly the problems the the, the problems with the parking parking problems and the other and the other irritants um, that 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 we that we've experienced. Yeah, I, uh, that we agree. When you have turnover of properties, obviously it leads to like a more transient population and people yeah. have less skin in the game when it comes to beautifying the area and so on. So uh, okay. okay, thank you. But my point was I wanted to deposit this in the public record. I'd like it to be known that this is not that the ownership is not stable. It's constantly changing and that and I'd like it to be and I'd like it to be uh, to be understood. Um, that this is this is one of the reasons um, that there are that there are various prob problems uh, on my street. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you, Mickey. Question number two. I invite the next question in the room to queue up if you'd like uh, behind the gentleman at the microphone. Bonsoir, mon nom est Daniel Asaraf. Bonsoir. Un commentaire et deux questions. Et ça va faire presque 28 ans que je habite à Côte Saint Luc. C'est la première fois que je me trouve dans ce type d'assemblée. Et est-ce que le fait qu'il y a des gens de sécurité, de la police, c'est toujours quand il y a des assemblées, je me sens extrêmement pas confortable, ou c'est parce que il y a quelque chose qui se passe dans vos têtes qui imagine que peut-être il y a des gens qui vont faire des choses. Non, non, la extrêmement sécurité, pas confortable, surtout pour une ville tellement paisible et tellement tranquille qu'il y a de la police. Je trouve ça assez bizarre. Deux questions. Comme j'ai dit, ça fait 26 ans que j'habite à Côte-Saint-Luc. La ville de Côte-Saint-Luc aujourd'hui n'est plus la ville qu'elle était 26 ans. Il y a des changements démographiques clairs et nets qui se, qui se représentent par le fait que la communauté francophone séfarade, orthodoxe, elle prend une majorité dans cette ville. Et deuxièmement, cette communauté, contrairement comme c'était avant, qu'il y avait les grandes synagogues, Bétion, Bétaran, Orchaïm, ce qui leur intéresse, c'est des centres d'études. C'est des jeunes qui veulent étudier le Talmud et qui veulent progresser dans ce qu'ils croient, dans le judaïsme. Si vous allez même aujourd'hui à Bétion, vous allez voir là-bas Shabbat, quatre Mianim, majoritairement séparates francophones. Vous allez aller à Orchaïm, la même chose, chez Benoliel, au même moment. 4, 5 minyanim, et des gens qui étudient toute la journée. Alors, vous avez dit tout à l'heure qu'on a fait des choses pas légales. Est-ce que la ville a pris en considération ce changement démographique, qui est une réalité C'est une réalité, il faut être aveugle pour ne pas le voir. Est-ce que vous avez pris en considération ce changement démographique pour amener des solutions à ces jeunes qui paient leurs impôts et c'est ça qu'ils demandent C'est la question numéro un. Question numéro deux par rapport au projet de PPC, moi, je sais qu'on s'est assis avec Mme Tania Bromovic, ça fait quelques semaines, et elle présente un flowchart. Okay? 
And you can see clearly on this flowchart <clears throat> a process that needs to be followed. So of course, meeting with the coordinator man, paying the fees. But during this flowchart, there is a situation that if there is a referendum and with approval, perfect, you go on. No approval, what do you do? Nothing. Which means you are asking us to go to this process when the flowchart flow is showing clearly that there is a risk for us in the event that there's a referendum, on the event of the adoption of, of, of the council will be rejected, we are gone. How do you ex expect us to do something like this? Thank you very much. Thank you for the questions. Okay, so I'll respond in kind, just so I understand your questions correctly. Number one is, have we planned for the demographic change? I apologize for answering in English. My English is better than my French. Uh, so have you planned for the demographics changes in Tlaxin Luke that have happened and will continue to happen? And uh, number two, the referendum process uh, carries a risk to those applicants and how do we mitigate those risks? Um, so number one, in terms of planning for demographics changes. So the changes in demographics have already begun and will continue obviously because the Orthodox Sephardic community, in fact, the entire Orthodox community of Tlaxin Luke is growing. It's not getting any smaller, it's continuing to grow and it represents uh, a good part of Um the, the biggest things we're doing to address those changes are in the master plan. Now with the first, PPCMY is the first part of it to give those institutions that are now operating in non-conforming residential zones to conform and become legal. The second part of this is the master plan, which the mayor has spoken of, which we did a first public consultation on uh, just last week, I want to say. Um, and the master plan is ongoing and it will be a one to two year process until we get it in place. So the master plan is going to identify different areas in Kotzin Luke where we want to grow and densify and put religious institutional use and commercial use and mixed use and more dense residential use. And this is planning for the future. It's planning for the next 10 to 20 years in the growth of Kotzin Luke. So we are well aware of the changing demographics. Um, the Sephardic community, as you said, does not represent the majority of the city. We are a majority Jewish city, uh, but one day perhaps it will. Perhaps the Orthodox community will represent a majority of Kutz and Nuke, and, and I welcome that. Uh, in terms of your question about the risks in applying for the Pepe Simwa, um, I can only speak for myself, but council and the mayor have already said that we're going to allow the process to go through to the referendum stage. There will be no stopping it beforehand. We're going to let it flow through to the end and we're prepared to make a public statement of that. We can't take away our own powers or own ability to allow that process to flow through, but we'll make a public statement that we are going to allow it to go to fruition. We want to work with all the institutions to ideally, and hopefully not go to a referendum point. As I said in my opening statements, we hope that all the groundwork has been laid and if it's not, then we should all come to the table and discuss it and find ways of compromising. Lee Manor Graham, do you have anything to add? Okay. Thank you for your question. Let's go to number three. Hi, how are you? Uh, I have uh, exactly to your comment, actually, I find it very interesting how you said that we're going to allow it to go through right to the referendum. And this is exactly where my concern is of rubber stamping the application process. I understand that it's supposed to go through the PAC, the Planning Advisory Committee, <clears throat> and that there are requirements that need to be met. My first question is, is that the requirements that need to be met are they non-negotiable or, or during the planning advisory committee, they'll make decisions whether or not the <clears throat> aforementioned uh, resident will need to comply with a certain requirement or not? Is there flexibility on this? I'll answer that question. The planning advisory committee is there to make recommendations <laughs> of which afterwards, the applicant can modify their proposal if they need to. So 
Absolutely, there are certainly non-negotiables. And number one is safety and security and building code studies. So that is certainly a non-negotiable. They definitely have to provide us with all of the studies executed by professionals. And we're gonna be reviewing them and ensuring that it well represents like what it is with their building capacity and, and everything involved. So that in addition to any potential exterior modifications as well to make sure that it goes through the same process as any type of building modification uh, request that we receive. So my, my, my secondary question to that, is there any requirements on no, noise barriers on, on noise insulation or? Yeah, there would certainly be requirements for noise. Okay. Yeah, definitely. And it's gonna be certainly case by case. So some, someone for a semi-detached would potentially have more requirements or different requirements than one for an individual home that the conditions would just be different. So certain requirements would vary slightly depending on the cases, but this is all gonna be thoroughly analyzed by the staff, by the planning advisory committee and the city council. And finally, just to understand this, so what I understood is that once they've submitted their plan and you've made recommendations, they've come back, they've changed their plan and it gets approved, they're getting approved based only on a plan, right? And then they have to act on that plan, but they could be approved before any actions or any changes have been made to the building. Right, so as part of the application process, it is actually quite detailed. So we're going into, we need feasibility studies of the work that's to be done. They need to send us basic cost estimates of the proposed work. So this is, I mean, we're looking at it as receiving a full fledged real and true project mm -hmm. where after it goes through the process, if it does get approved in the end, and in that case, their application and their project would be treated as any construction permit application would, and they would be required to submit their required documents. Perfect. But what happens if they don't follow through? They follow through all these actions. They get approved. Referendum goes through. They, they get their resident. Everything's great. But this action plan, they've never acted on any of their action plans. What, how could I, it's, my question is fundamental in the sense that City of Quote St. Luke has done nothing over four years to enforce current bylaws. You're creating a new bylaw. And how are you going to ensure that you're going to enforce the actions and the construction or the changes or the modifications that need to take place? Well, most of the changes would, if it would be, would maybe be structural and these are safety related. So we have full faith in these institutions that of course, if anything comes up that they see is potentially an issue, it's gonna be corrected. So- I'm sorry, I can, I, you said faith. I, I mean, I need more than faith because faith, I mean, these a lot of these institutions with the numerous complaints, with the numerous letters that they've received have continued to operate. So we can't operate on faith. If there's an action plan, I'd like to know how are you going to enforce it? What are your timelines? What are you going to do to enforce these action plans? Because you've approved them based on these action plans. If I may, Tanya, um, just the fact that we're here enacting this bylaw, hopefully, should tell you everything. Mm -hmm. um, your, your, your question, I, look, I understand where you're coming from, mm -hmm. um, but I say that was then and this is now. Uh, when you start the process, when these institutions are going to start this process, the expectation is that they're going to follow through. They'll have done all the professional studies. They'll have spent the money doing these studies, checking their structural soundness, fire escapes, and so on. Um, and at that point, we expect them to act in good faith and follow through with the work. And uh, I am of the opinion, and I believe my council and my mayor is too, that they will not only be legally obligated, but morally obligated to follow through because by doing so, they'll ensure the safety of their congregations. They're not getting any smaller, they're gonna get bigger. These places are going to get more dangerous. Eventually, God forbid, something will happen and it'll be on us and on them that we didn't act to make sure that everyone worshiping in there, studying in there, 
are safe. Okay, so this is gonna be my last comment. Once they're approved, and what I'm hearing is, I'm not hearing very strong enforcement language. What I'm not hearing that from anybody here, but you will have increased the risk tenfold because now they're legal, now they're permitted to be there, and yet the action plans will not be followed through. And, and there's faith and good faith cannot be presumed in the situation any longer because of where we are. So when I hear faith and good faith, I, I, we can't operate that way. So what I'm hearing, and I'm not hearing strong enforcement is going to take place. Yes, please, Charles, enlighten me. Good evening, Mrs. Alfonso. Is this working? Yes, it is. Yeah. Um, the way it will work, it's a valid question, is this part of the process is hopefully to adopt a bylaw mm -hmm. that my department will be expected to, uh, to uh, enforce. And to your specific questions, we haven't yet determined some of the delays that we'll be giving the owners of said properties in which to, for example, make the application. Mm -hmm. I fully understand your question. It cannot be open-ended. There has to be a, you know, a start and end date. Same goes for once the application is made. There needs to be a, a maximum time period that we need to receive all the documents. So... That will be something that my department will be working on in the near future. Once this bylaw is in force, a letter will go out to all the owners, explaining to them all the different delays and steps that they have. So that'll be clear. And the expectation is definitely that urban planning will, uh, will stick to these delays and uh, enforce them as required. Okay, I'll just, I'll just end it there because obviously I have no faith in enforcement when it comes to the city. But I'll, I'll leave it there. Okay, let's uh, take the next question, perhaps one on Zoom, Director Levine. Uh, yes, we have a question that reads, if one of the goals is to allow for a legal method for future potential residential religious institutions, why is this bylaw restricted to only a few of the residential zones. Okay, so the purpose of the Pepe is uh, is not for future institutions in residential zones. Um, it is to regulate those that are currently existing in residential zones. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong. You're right and wrong. The, <laughs> the well, intention wrong. is to address the ones that are currently there, though technically, legally, future ones can apply. They have to go through, they would have to go through the same process, but the, the, the goal or the impetus behind this one is that we address the ones that currently exist. Thank you, Associate City Manager Branovich. Hey, I hope that answered the question. Uh, why don't we do another live? Question um, five, I believe, are we on five, four, five? I don't see anybody holding up a what the paper for. Number five. Let's get you leaving. Good evening. Um, I wanted to first start by just touching on a statement by Mayor Brownstein right before he spoke about the Jewish Council. I just find the timing interesting how the city of Montreal was passing a unanimously recognizing the month of May as the Jewish Heritage Month. Meanwhile, our fully Jewish Council was uh, putting in place a process against observant Jews that could jeopardize and could close some of our city's Jewish institutions. The timing of this Pepe process is also particularly worrisome as it comes on the heels of the city's failing at facilitating a long promised synagogue institution to Rabbi Ben Oyel, a Sephardic synagogue that was not even allowed to be built next to a dog park, an empty field right next to train tracks public works, and even a hospital that would have benefited from this synagogue. So it would be difficult for me to have faith in this new process when such disasters like this are still going and fresh in our community's mind. So I'll get to my questions. Uh, in reviewing the issues at hand, uh, the Pepe Simois fails to address many of the predominant issues that Cote Saint Luc residents have brought up in terms of these synagogues. The issues that I've heard mentioned, such as noise, traffic, and garbage, are first of all existent in all types of synagogues, whether they are residential or normal synagogues. I uh, just yesterday had trouble finding parking next to TBDJ because they were hosting the graduation of Hebrew Academy. 
over and above this, even when synagogues will conform, that would conform with Pepe Simois. So here's my first question. These issues will still exist even afterwards. There will still be issues of garbage. There will still be issues of traffic because now these are just conforming synagogues. So that's my first one. I'll let you address it or you want me to just uh, go through all of them. Okay, so you're you're absolutely right that Pepe Simois does not address directly the, call them neighborly concerns. Uh, the concerns of garbage cleanliness, parking, noise, et cetera. Uh, noise to a certain extent it does. Um, but what I believe it does is it brings all of these issues into the light of day and gets everyone to the same table communicating. Um, I think one of, the, one of the issues has been lack of communication and lack of understanding on both sides. Um, and I hope that dialogue will help to solve some of those problems. Um, you said a couple of things. So number one, this is the Pepe Simois bylaw is absolutely not a tool that will help us to quote, shut down any places of worship or study. Uh, in fact, we have the ability to do that right now. And we have not. The Pepe Simois is a, an open door to legality. Um, it is giving the opportunity to those that are now in non-conforming residences a chance to become legal. So it is not absolutely not a tool for shutdown, period. I just want to clarify, I didn't mention it was a tool to shut down. I said it could possibly shut down certain synagogues. Absolutely not. We council always has had that ability to enforce our bylaws. We have not. So just to touch on that, it's been 30 years that some of these institutions have been in place, have been in place. And you've mentioned part of the concern is the safety of the residents. So am I to understand or deduce from this that for 30 years, the safety of our residents was not a priority? Not that it wasn't a priority. Um, it's a very different uh, situation now versus 30 years ago. So it was, uh, I believe 37 years ago that the first one opened, this was on Bailey. Um, at that time, there was one, there was probably one minion. We're talking about 10 people, one place of worship, and that was it. Fast forward to today, we're talking about something very, very different. And as you grow, and as the institution, the number of the institutions and the size of the institutions grow, as does the risk. So was it time to act years ago? Probably, but better now than not. Okay. but. I want to address one thing you said as yeah, well go ahead. in terms of the uh, unrelated issue of the of the Colel of the uh, application for the project on Mackle at the uh, at the public works firm. So this is an unrelated issue, obviously. Um, I have gone on the record with with this uh, this thought, this comment, and I do believe that the location is appropriate, but the project was too large for that lot with no setback. So I would like nothing more than to find a permanent home for the Colel. Um, in that spot, this particular project was just straight up too large and too close to the sidewalk. Um, but I hope that we can come back to the table and find an appropriate, either an appropriate location or an appropriate project for, for the Colel. So, so keeping in, in theme of your mentioning of, the, of discussions and open discussions, this process seems like it's been done backwards, whereas a bylaw has been presented instead of discussing what the needs and how the community really works. And where has it been exemplified is the idea of rezoning the commercial areas for synagogues. And part of that just highlights the fact that there's a lack of understanding of what the need of a Jew and a synagogue and what it relates. Because for example, the place that was rezoned on Westminster, there aren't many Jews that live around there practicing that are gonna walk there on Shabbat. It's a question of walking in that. So I just wanna understand why things cannot be perhaps consulted and discussed instead of being forced all the way through to a referendum, which keeping in mind another thing, what's the tax costs on that? We're looking at the tax cost to us as citizens to run that referendum for things to be probably pushed to further courts. I mean, our tax dollars can be better used and there are many other priorities in our community that should be addressed instead of pushing things through all the way to a referendum like this. Yeah, just another reason I hope we never get to referendum because of course there is a cost associated. One thing we do understand that you just touched on there is that the, the issues are hyper-local. So the needs of 
certain communities are very local. We can't say, you know, we're going to rezone uh, the Cary Square or the Cavendish Mall for some because it's just not realistic to walk there on Shabbat. These are issues that exist in, you know, within a 10, 15 block radius. So we understand that. Um, as for the, the process going kind of backwards, and that's why we're here. We haven't adopted this bylaw yet. We've uh, read the first draft. We've done the first draft reading. We have not yet adopted it. We're having public consultation. Um, we hope to move forward or in a direction sooner than later. But this is the reason why we're here, the reason why we're opening this dialogue. We want your questions. We're going to take them back with us and, and discuss them and uh, move forward with consultation. That's it. Yeah, please. I would like to add something. I have spent personally a huge amount of time um, talking to people, right? I've talked to all the rabbis. I've read every single one of those letters in great detail. I've talked to all, all sorts of people. So the understanding of what the community needs, we know that these places of worship are not just places to pray. They are places you go for study, for marriage counseling, for community, for multiple generations to get to know each other. I, I really personally come to deeply understand what they're, what they're there for and what needs they, they fulfill. And when you have, if it's far away, it doesn't fulfill the same need. So the commercial establishments was one tool, right? It was one tool. It helped legalize the bells on top of a dar. Um, we've, there's been congregations that have been added. We certainly know that it is not, even, even these places of worship now that we're talking about, they're not necessarily even big enough for the, where the community is going. So that, that's why, I mean, we're, we're late on the draw with this process. We are at least on time and doing the master plan process right. So the master plan process is to sit down with the community to find out where it's growing. I mean, they're, they're located in certain parts of town. So it's, and to see where, where it's heading and what can be zoned to accommodate that growth, not just in terms of these places, but in terms of schools, how are we, fit, like the, there's a whole larger picture, which unfortunately we didn't do before, but we're very aware of now, we're conscious. Just I understand. Say. Just to clarify one point, the bells were on top of a dar before it was rezoned. Fully aware. <laughs> Thank, Thank you. I consider myself lucky I didn't debate you. You would have slaughtered me. <laughs> Counselor. <laughs> Counselor, can I suggest we do one of the... Uh, Let's go question on, Zoom on Zoom, please. Calls? No problem. Hi. Oh, there's feedback. Sorry. Okay. Um, okay, so I posted my question in the Q&A, so you can ignore that one, because I wasn't sure that I was going to get on this way. Um, I live on Eldridge, and um, I have no problem with anybody who wants to follow their faith and worship and have their synagogue. I have a problem with it being in the house connected to mine where I rent and I am often disturbed by my neighbors. I'm happy that they have what they need for them to grow as a congregation. I just don't think it's appropriate to do it in a home. And I wanna know how you're going to protect the residents who just wanna live there quietly, who wanna be able to park in front of their house on a Saturday if they don't get home in time on Friday before Shabbat happens and there's nowhere to put your car, I want to know what happens with all the garbage, which is everywhere in Cote St. Luke, much more than ever before. I'm not saying it's just because of these congregations. I'm saying because there's so many more people walking and dropping garbage because I see it because I walk a lot and there's a lot of garbage, and I want to know how the city is going to handle the overpopulation in that way, not just in the way of where people get to worship, but also in the upkeep of our city, because I feel that it's very different than when I grew up here, and I've lived here for most of my life, and I want to know about the noise, and I know that you mentioned it a few minutes ago, but you weren't in my house on Purim. Okay, so yeah, I did, I did touch on that. Um, 
These are these orange. I'm feed, am I feeding back? Okay, these are obviously issues that need to be addressed further. Um, as I said earlier, in enacting this bylaw, or even even after the first draft reading and having you all here and asking these questions, um, again, it shines a light on the related issues that are not directly linked to the Pepe Um, How are those issues solved? I don't have all the answers right now, but I know that communication and dialogue and everyone understanding that those issues exist is step number one of a process. Um, perhaps we need to further enforce other bylaws, be a little more strict in terms of the cleanliness. Perhaps we need, and something that I brought to the table as a, a first weak elected official back five years ago, I said, I want a beautification bylaw. And uh, my then city manager Abramovich said, what's that? <laughs> um, a minimum standard for maintaining your property. Maybe that's something we can look at. I think TMR has something in, uh, in their bylaws. Um, these are all things that can perhaps mitigate these issues. But as I said, it gets everybody to the table, it gets everybody communicating, and it helps us to better understand what the underlying problems are. That's so can I just add one point. If, if our city is not as clean as it used to be in terms of like, we don't find the maintenance, you know, if we're having issues with garbage in general or other things in general, these are things that the city has to address and examine anyway. So I'll be discussing this with my director of public works. Okay, well, I actually sent an email to my, um, the person in charge of my district. And frankly, the answer I got was very, yeah, we know about it. Uh, there's not much that we can do. So I didn't find that to be that satisfying. Um, so for the beautification, like, why isn't that in place? I don't understand. Like when you walk down Eldridge, it's, it's like living in a trailer park. Okay. So as for the, the bylaw I mentioned, beautification bylaw, it's, uh, it's tricky. Um, there are levels to which you can enact a bylaw like that. Um, most of them go too far, in my opinion. For example, TMR, I think you have to keep your grass at a certain length. So we don't necessarily want to go that far, but it is something I'd like to explore further. Um, as uh, Associate City Manager Abramovich said, we're going to take it up with Public Works and make sure that we're maintaining those standards of cleanliness in the city. There needs to be an extra focus on Eldridge, then so be it. I have flagged Wavell as an issue near me. I find it a little dirty, but that's where the wind blows into the fence line at the at the CP tracks between Wavell and and uh, and the southern part of Cote Saint Luke. Um, there are certainly problem areas, and if you have issues to report, I, I would suggest you just email Public Works directly. There's no reason to go through your elected official. Email Public Works at Cote Saint Luke .org. Um, The staff is excellent at creating work orders and passing on. Uh, the work and triaging it to the appropriate person or foreman. So please do that because we want to know, we operate on data and information. And if we need to know things, this is how we find them out. Okay, let's go to the gentleman who's been very patient at the microphone. Thank you. <clears throat> so first of all, I just like to address some of the issues because I'd like to call on my co-citizens here to focus on real issues and not create things such as the tax implications of running a referendum when we all knew that this, if this was a taxation issue, we wouldn't be authorizing any synagogue because once a synagogue is designated a synagogue, it no longer pays taxes, which by the way, doesn't bother me and is not a reason not to regulate the synagogues. But let's cut the bull because a lot of what's going on is bull. Also, a lot of what's been going on and I don't like mincing words, it's bordered on gangsterism. People come in, here's a house, let's take it, let's use it for our own purpose, to hell with the neighbors. It has not been done in a way that has any consideration for the neighbors and is in any way conducive for good neighborliness. And I'm saying all this, by the way, in spite of the fact that I agree 
with this man over here, that there is a changing demographic and there is uh, a heightened need to address the needs of that demographic. The reality is, and it's sad in a certain respect, that we have conflated addressing the growing needs of a certain religious community, which has very legitimate needs, with the need to tolerate zoning bylaw violations and health and safety violations, violations and transforming residential neighborhoods where there is a completely other way. I'm feeling partially that maybe we're not looking enough out of the block, outside of the, uh, out of the box, because this is a growing issue. I am very concerned, maybe this is more of a statement than a question, I am very concerned with the fact that we're sitting here and saying, if you come and you do something illegal and stand your ground, if I start a brothel on my street, you're not gonna sit and tolerate it. The real reason you're not gonna sit and tolerate it is I'm not gonna have a whole gaggle of, of, of local residents sitting and supporting it. But there are a whole host of, of violations I could be committing, but because I'm not part of that community, you will have zero tolerance. Why is it that Tanya Alfonsi was forced to live in a situation where there was a complete disregard for her enjoyment of her property, and now everybody is hell-bent on uh, legalizing and legitimizing it? That is the problem that I have with the direction. I think that is part of what is creating the schism in this community that isn't necessary. Here's what I'd like to see happen. And I'd like to know if it's possible. And I'm also going to add, I live on one of the streets that you want to rezone. So here we have Mr. asking, why don't we go to, why do we have to go to a referendum and let the local residents decide if they want their enjoyment of their houses desecrated by these non-residential uses? I am entitled to have a certain degree of tranquility and decorum on my street. And there's nothing to do with the other residents around me because I have nothing against them. And at the same time, when I bought on my block, it was a residential block. Why the fact that new populations are moving in and have created a situation where they have disregarded the law and that's brought more because people congregate around these buildings are now being able to say, well, we're the majority, you have lost your right to the peace, tranquility, and decorum on your block? Why is there no enforcement when kids are sitting and setting off firecrackers on Lac Boimé and you know, waking up the whole block when some of us have kids? Here is my question, because this all does need to be addressed. And, and, and I do believe that it is your right to have the type of institutions you need that are conducive with your community. Is there a parcel, are there parcels of land that are still undeveloped in Cote St. Luke? Because we realize also as time goes on, there's not just a need to accommodate the communities that you know, are, are demographically shifting, but there are a whole lot of other concerns such as densification, as you mentioned. Is there an area with a significant amount of undeveloped property where, we could be doing something properly, not on some little triangle of land next to my house on the other side, but where there can be, like they have in Paris, you know, eight to 12 story buildings where the bottom will be maybe kolils and synagogues and you have residents and you can have whole communities growing around them. Is that a possibility in the community and something being looked into? Okay, so <clears throat> let's sorry for taking the first time. part of your comments. You have been heard. Uh, you've been heard by all of us up here. I invite you to, if you'd like to continue the conversation, there'll be further them listening groups, focus groups to get feedback from the residents. So we, we'd want to hear more and we don't, we're pressed for time now. Um, so I invite you to reach out to either to me or to your city councilor and look forward your information to uh, Ms. Abramovich. Um, the short answer to a question of whether there is uh, anywhere to develop is no. That's one of our issues in Cote St. Luke is most of our land is developed or 99 plus. Snow dump? Pardon? What about the snow dump? Um, the snow dump is the snow dump. 
if we develop a snow dump, then uh, we have nowhere to dump our snow, to coin a phrase. Um, so short answer, we do not have any undeveloped land. However, we are in the process of consulting and developing a master plan. Will the master plan solve the, as I said, hyper local issues that are kind of, uh, I guess, symptoms of the need for places of worship and study in my district, in district six and seven, which are kind of bound by Westminster and, and Park Haven or Einstein? Uh, perhaps uh, we can look at different ways of either densifying or finding homes for them. But the point is that we understand the issues are hyperlocal. We're not going to invite someone to go and open a place of worship and study at the Cary Square when we know that they live, you know, in the uh, Eldridge Melling Leger area. Um, Tanya, do you have anything you'd like to add? Or I, I want to add. Um, I want to add something about language, and and this applies to to both sides. So I, I heard what you said. Um, my my issue or concern is so you use two terms that i sort of I'm like oh one of them is gangsterism and the other one is comparing synagogues to brothels so what you were saying is the brothels are like the epitome of a use that no one would want and and but so so but i also um in talking to the neighbors who are often called anti-semites and haters that there's a there's a a language that both communities need to use. So when you talk about gangsters, it makes the religious community seem like hoods. And when you talk, when religious community or people who are talking about people who are trying to have peaceable enjoyment are called anti-Semites and haters, it's like, I just want to enjoy my property. Why am, why am I being called an anti-Semite? So I think that when we talk about language and language use, everybody has to really carefully choose their words on, on every side because people, people have the, they're sensitive to it and it bothers them. So I just, I just want to address this from, from all terms. It's, it's really, words matter. I just wanted to add that. Yeah, I, I couldn't agree more. Um, yeah, terms like that we want to avoid. And this all comes from really what amounts to a total miscommunication, lack of communication on both sides, um, which we're trying and have begun to try and fix. Uh, these listening groups, focus groups are ways of having people from both sides of the debate. And I hesitate even using the word sides because we are, we should all be on the same side. Of course, we're not, I'm not naive. Um, but our goal is to get everyone talking and understanding all of the issues that are affecting each other. It's a multi-step process and it's not gonna be solved overnight. Councillor, we have a question on Zoom. Please. Gad, go ahead, please. Hi, thank you very much. Uh, name is Gad Ben Susan. I'm a Kutsanuk resident for 36 years. I've lived in four different addresses in Kutsanuk. A lot of my family is in Kutsanuk extended family, which is probably a dozen households or so. We pay their taxes, we're good citizens, etc. First of all, this is a beautiful city and this is a challenge. This is not the first city in North America to have gone through a demographic that has become more observant. And there's places where this caused more conflict between the residents, and there's places where they work to benefit from both sides that come from this and living together. And, and it feels like it's not going in the right way. And, and I don't blame anybody for this. I think it's just reality creeps up on you with time. I, I think, you know, I appreciate, by the way, the comment about the gangsterism and all that. Uh, I appreciate also the emotions of those words coming out. I don't think they were given in a, any intent of uh, of insult. I was myself not religious, not observant. You know, I've turned observant maybe 20 years ago. So I do feel that I have an appreciation for both sides speaking here. Um, I, I do appreciate also the reminder to speak civilly and the police presence, you know, we're professionals, we're working government, we're working multinational com companies. Um, you know, it's, it's just uh, a bit odd, but I don't think it's a topic, but let's, let's uh, move on to my question. So first of all, you know, some, I think that there is a certain belief or a feeling by some of the residents who are 
have a congregation that opened next to them that those who want to have a, a congregation just come and open and do it their own way. And I feel for you and I want to express to you, having lived in four different addresses in Kutzenluk, I've been a member of different congregations and in winter and a winter storm, you don't want to be walking 40 minutes. So the fact that they are disturbed, dispersed is an advantage to a certain way. I can tell you every synagogue that I've been part of, the rabbis and the leadership continuously remind the congregates, we are in a residential area, please be respectful of the parking and so forth. And it doesn't always happen. You know, I, I, I once was, it was Yom Kippur and the day before Yom Kippur, I parked in front of a, of a house and the lady came out and kind of lashed at me and asked her, what am I doing wrong? You know, we talk to everybody in the shul, we ask them, respect the parking, don't edge into people's driveway. And she said, you know, you don't understand. You guys have grown, you're a successful congregation, that's great. I never have a parking spot in front of my house. I can never go pick up my elderly senior mother and bring her in because I can't park in. And that hit a chord, you know, and I believe, you know, being in a residential area, there is a lot of sacrifice that happened to the residents that are around, whether it's noise on poor and party. Whether it's noise on Purim parties or whether it's garbage, I, I think that's unacceptable. You know, part of religious law is that we have to res be respectful of our neighbors, right? And not be disturbing because of, of what we're doing. So I, I think, you know, the process is clear. Uh, it's good that there is at least dialogue. The mayor mentioned listening to residents, listening to the congregations. It is appreciated. We're seeing the effort. Um, I think we have to work towards bylaws and implement the bylaws. That's part of running a professional and a, a city with laws, which is necessary, whether it's civil laws or religious law, both, ex both expect that, right? Um, what we, we did notice is that we're not trying to find a solution. And, and I think I appreciate this, the three point of views they put in the beginning of, of doing nothing or staying status quo or, or doing what we're doing today. I think at the end of the day, what we're trying to achieve is a solution that works for the congregations that exist and potential congregations of the future and then the other institutions that may be needed, schools, et cetera, like was mentioned by a lady in the room. We also have to find solutions that work for the residents. We don't, we're not um, disregarding the residents who are there. You know, I, I've had people, you know, discussing this conversation amongst ourselves, right? Amongst the people who are congregates and saying, you know, how would you like people to park in front of your house all the time? Parking in front of my house doesn't belong to me, but if I never had it available, and if I once every two weeks get my, my driveway blocked even partially, that is disturbing. And I think that's something that there is a lot of dialogue in the congregations to try and respect more. Now, the concern that I have is that the way I understood the process of being proposed is it's gonna be a way where the synagogues, at least the existing congregations have to apply and if they don't get it, then they'll need to move or they may be closed. And I don't think, you know, I mean, if you look at the residents who have been around these synagogues, I would, I think it would be safe to assume that any synagogue that will apply will get some objections from the local residents. And I, I actually understand them because considering how long the problem has lingered and been maintained this way, I understand why some of the residents would say, no, I don't want here next to me, right? Like the resident on Eldridge, like the gentleman who spoke before me, like the lady who spoke about the poor noise on Shabbat. I think it's important that all the residents understand that we're not looking to just do what we want and we don't care. I think we do have to find solution. My concern with the city's proposed process is that when we go to a negotiation table, as you mentioned, you, you know, you, as the mayor mentioned, he's done more negotiations and litigation, right? When we go to a table, and there's two sides that need improvement to the solution. Then we need to find a path that is viable for both. The way the process is being proposed would potentially put the existing congregations in, put in your applications. If there's no objections, then you'll get the permit, but there's nowhere to go. I do think some of the congregations do have work to do. You mentioned safety first, absolutely. I think any synagogue that does not have the safety measurements that are required should be putting them in place, right? And I think 
it's not enough like the previous lady uh, said Erica, you okay? i've got to get you to wrap up okay because we have to get to the rest of the questions I got it. sure sure so uh, can i continue yeah yeah please it was yeah. a question so, that you wanted to uh, to ask but, yeah, there is a question, but I think there's a feeling of two sides here that are opposing and what we need to achieve is ways of working together. So my question is this. I think in order to respect both sides of the coin and both sides of the, of the that require a better solution, I, my ask is to modify the process, right, so that the congregations get immediately requested to adhere to the safety laws that are required based on their current locations, right? But that the process does not put the congregations on one side of elimination, because the way the process is proposed, they can just be requesting, getting denied because of objections from residents, and therefore getting closed without a solution. So my question is, can we adopt the process so it's fair for both the residents so that the bylaws are enforced, at least in the current location, until the location is found? Okay, so if I understand you correctly, is there a different way we could adjust or tweak this bylaw to, to I don't want to say use the word grandfather, but we've, we've researched many, many different options. Um, this is the process that matches our needs the best. Um, yes, there is the, the possibility, unfortunately, that it would go to referendum, be the decision of the residents. Our goal is not to get to that point um that we communicate beforehand and put in the pieces that are necessary so that it doesn't get to that stage um but unfortunately there is no no existing tool we can't grandfather we can't just you know rezone like that the residents have to have a say by law for a zoning amendment or zoning change um i don't know is there anything else to that Daniel? mr mayor um, Okay, but uh, Gad, I do, I would ask that if you, again, I, it's not like a broken record, if you want to continue the conversation, because we don't have huge amounts of time now, to reach out to me directly, if you want to continue it offline, or come and meet with uh, with me, the mayor, with Tanya, and we can, we can continue. Okay, let's take a question in person, numero set, please. Thank you. Bonjour, Monsieur Kujlatsky, bonjour, uh, les conseillers, bonjour, Monsieur le maire. Charles Wanoun, je suis résident à Côte-Saint-Luc depuis euh, 25 ans. Et euh, ça fait plus de 13 ans que nous travaillons sur le dossier de parc Even. Aujourd'hui, on parle de PPC moi. Et je suis un petit peu sceptique à savoir si cette direction est vraiment pour euh, légaliser les, les institutions présentes. Et je vais apporter les points qui me permettent de pouvoir avoir cette, cette réflexion. Il y a 13 ans, nous avons voulu aller et construire une, une synagogue, donc une institution qui serait bien entendu aux normes. Et donc, on a demandé un changement de zonage. Un changement de, de, de zonage. Cette demande-là a été refusée, c'était sur ma corde. Elle a été refusée avant même d'aller au référendum et ça a été par rapport au fait que le maire nous a invités, nous avons fait une présentation de, de, la, de la congrégation et suite à ça, nous a promis de nous trouver un terrain. Nous avons été invités, nous a présenté le terrain. À un moment donné, c'était une certaine grandeur et au moment de la proposition d'achat du terrain, parce qu'il faudrait que la ville de côte saint luc sache que nous avons une offre d'achat sur un terrain qui se trouve en arrière ou juste à côté du dog park. D'accord Et ça, ça a été un terrain qui a été proposé par le maire en nous disant que ce terrain serait la solution idéale. C'est vrai que ce n'est pas un terrain qui est plaisant. Il y a un dog park, vous avez les garbage en arrière, vous avez les travaux publics, mais nous allons vous, vous être sûr qu'on n'aura pas de réticence par rapport au voisinage, vu qu'il n'y a personne, il y a un hôpital juste en face. Alors, on s'est retrouvé avec, effectivement, comme disait, une cigarette de terrain, et on a demandé de, si on pouvait construire quelque chose, et on a demandé de certaines dérogations. Alors, on a travaillé assez fort pour présenter des plans à la ville, 
Et en présentant ces plans à la ville, il y a eu une consultation où, euh, vous comprenez, quand on, quand on sent que la ville veut travailler avec une congrégation, on sent que qu'on les implique. Si on sait qu'il y a de la, de la réticence ou voisinage, on va les inviter, ces gens-là. On va leur dire un petit peu le, le, le bon de cette communauté. Qu'est-ce qu'elle fait pour la communauté On n'a pas été invité, mais on va mettre ça de côté. On a présenté le projet. Le projet a été refusé par rapport aux grandeurs. Donc, juste à la première étape, on dit c'est trop grand. C'est correct. On peut retourner au… On, comme vous avez dit, ça prend un dialogue. Donc, c'est juste de nous dire, c'est trop gros, on n'accepte pas, retournez à la table de dessin et rapportez-nous un dessin qui va être accepté. Voici les normes et on ne donne aucune dérogation. Alors, ça a été refusé, puis on reçoit une lettre nous demandant si que ce terrain, si on l'achète, il ne servira à rien parce que la ville ne fera rien du tout pour autoriser ça. Donc, ce côté-là, je, je, je veux bien comprendre que le PPC, moi, a cette connotation de vouloir dire on va légaliser. Mais vous comprenez que il est impossible. Vous voyez très, très bien que on n'a même pas vu la, le processus qui nous a été montré. Il ne l'a même pas été présenté du processus par lequel vous passez. Donc, vous voulez prendre des organismes qui, ont, qui sont à but non lucratif. Qui, euh, qui sont là qu'à donner du, du service à la communauté. Et je pense que ce serait peut-être un autre volet à prendre pour parler du bien de ces communautés. Qu'est-ce qu'ils font à la ville de Côte-Saint-Luc Est-ce que vous avez les problèmes que pointe au tremble là Est-ce que Côte-Saint-Luc a la, la criminalité que Montréal-Nord a ben, On n'a on a pas ce genre de choses parce que Côte-Saint-Luc, les enfants ont où aller les enfants sont pris en charge. Bon, là, on a, on a un processus, un processus qui va à l'échec. On a des organismes qui sont déjà en place, des institutions qui ont fait des rénovations, qui ont présenté pour pouvoir sécuriser leur édifice. Donc, on est, on est, on est tout en règle. Le, le, le bien-être bien de, nos, de nos congrégants est aussi important que comme si c'était chez nous. D'accord Donc, le processus qui va être mis en place, c'est un processus pour aller à l'élimination. Si, pourquoi on n'irait on, on pas Vous avez montré trois étapes. Vous avez montré le statu quo et vous avez dit que le statu quo n'est pas possible. Pourquoi ne pas parler d'un statu quo conditionnel C'est-à-dire, vous êtes là depuis 30 ans, vous avez reçu des gens au fédéral, vous avez reçu des maires qui sont venus se présenter, des, 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 des conseillers qui sont venus faire leur, leur, leur présentation. Pourquoi ne pas parler d'un statu quo conditionnel, conditionnel au respect du voisinage, conditionnel aux au, 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 au poubelles, aux problèmes de poubelles, conditionnel au bruit, conditionnel à passer à un, un examen de sécurité Peut-être que ça serait un, un, une chose viable, mais je reviens à la case départ. Pourquoi un terrain qui se trouve en arrière, qui est prêt à construire les mesures qui sont, comme disait le monsieur, donner la possibilité d'avoir un terrain et de construire. Donc, même là, même à cette étape-là, on voit que la ville ne met aucun effort. Ça me laisse... Ça me laisse à, à, à penser que la fierté que vous avez d'avoir un, 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 une, une ville où le maire et tous ses conseillers sont de confession juive et qu'on se retrouve à cette table aujourd'hui et qu'il n'y a pas d'avancement là-dessus, ça me laisse à savoir, à, 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 à me poser la question, c'est où est le problème voilà, donc euh, je vous remercie et bonne soirée. Et merci pour, pour vos questions. Euh, là, je réponds très vite en anglais, si, parce que j'ai hâte de, de m'expresser un petit peu en français. Um, of course, I, I don't mean to repeat myself. The reason we're here is to discuss PPC moi. I understand that the issue of 
the refused project for the Colel on Mackel is for many related to that, um, more in terms of trust in your city officials. Um, the reason we're here is to try to rebuild the trust. Um, and as I said before, I hate to repeat myself, this is not trust that will be built or rebuilt overnight. It's a process, but we are here to listen. You've been heard, je comprends tout que vous avez dit. Um, J'étais là pour, pour toutes les discussions du Colel. Um, I was one of the ones who said, the project is too big. And we said, make the smaller project, make the smaller project, shrink it down, remove this, remove that. Unfortunately, that didn't happen. There needs to be a dialogue. There needs to be a compromise. In that case, it didn't happen, but it is our intention to try to find a permanent home for the Colel. Um, I think I, yeah, but uh, yeah, please. I think we had one more question in the room, correct? And, and I will just say one thing. I mean, we're pushing uh, 840 right now. I, uh, I wanna make sure that all the questions that were, were not uh, asked on Zoom will be responded to um, in short order. I don't know if uh, tomorrow, but in the next couple of days, we're gonna respond to every question that we weren't able to get to on Zoom. Councillor, if I, if I may, uh, for the folks who have their hands up in Zoom, since we won't be able to get to your live questions, as Councillor Kajafsky said, if you could please use the Q&A button to ask your question, that way it will be responded to uh, tomorrow. I will personally answer them tomorrow. You have the last Thank you. Word, Good evening, Philip Levy. We, we know each other, we've discussed many times. Um, I came in with dozens of ideas and questions that I had for all of you guys and wondering what each side was gonna come and say. And after being here for nearly two hours, all I hear is a group of people who are against synagogues being here and a group of people who are for synagogues here being here. I don't hear any of these groups feeling like Pepe Semois responds to their needs. Why is the city, councillors, mayor, pushing for this project to move forward as fast as it is going instead of bringing this a step back and actually sitting with real negotiations and real solutions. Pepe Semua does not answer any one of the concerns that was brought by the opposition tonight. And Pepe Semua does not answer the security risk that we have that we feel that these synagogues are gonna be shut down one way or another. That being said, some of you mentioned tonight that Pepe Semua and the future synagogues are also taken care of through the master plan. I assisted, I was present on the Zoom, was it last week or the week before? There's no plan for creating new zones that meet the needs for these synagogues by being in proximity. We're talking about strip malls and the redevelop redevelopment of Kotzi and Luke Shopping Center, Cavendish Mall, and the Cary Square, none of which answer the needs of these existing communities, which today have a problem. And as both you and Tanya have mentioned numerous times, are growing. Why is the city not backing down and bringing all parties to a table where we can find real solutions? Okay, so let's go point by point. Um, so in terms of the speed of the process, uh, we are here, we're consulting. The first draft bylaw was read. We have not yet adopted. We can go at whatever speed we choose. Um, I agree that we should be consulting and speaking further before we jump to anything. Um, I almost feel like it's uh, when both sides hate something, it's almost a, a good thing. You have a uh, something that might, you know, <laughs> if something doesn't work for anyone, it might work for everyone, but we go at whatever speed we choose. If we want to further consult, if we want to have more focus groups, more listening groups, we will do so. And I think the plan is to do so. Um, the master plan, yes, the master plan primarily focused on the three large developments, but it can potentially address the local issues, the proximity issues, as you said. Um, we don't have a lot of undeveloped land, but we do have certain areas, whether it be the old Raffi lot, uh, potential development uh, at the corner of Mackle Westminster, um, 5555 Westminster, which is relatively local. 
there are areas that we can look at to either densify or potentially rezone for mixed or institutional use. So I'm not, you know, there are no promises for anything, but the point is that we are consulting and we want to explore whatever options make sense. Um, I know Tanya for sure has something to add here. So please, you don't, that's good. Okay, all right, I'll take that as a compliment. All right, so Mr. Mayor, if you yeah, if no, you'd like, um, thank good, you, Philip. Good job, uh, Councillor Kajaski and uh, staff. Et uh, merci à tout le monde. Je pense que vous pouvez être fier de la façon que vous avez agi ce soir. I reviewed all the comments on Zoom uh, as well, and I think uh, overall people uh, gave their points of view in a respectful way. And you have to realize this PCM what process not happening overnight. It's a parallel process that's happening at the same time as our master plan process. The PCM law is an opportunity for individuals to perhaps get the zoning allowed where they are and stay where they are. But at the same time, it's a parallel process, meaning the city's doing exactly all the things that you're asking us to do. Do I see something? Maybe at the Rafi land site, do I see something? At the Cavendish Mall site, do I see something like in Israel where you have condos and commerce on top of synagogue? I, I see all those things in Kotze Muk in the future. I see places at the Cavendish Mall where a Jewish community, if they don't live close enough by today, will live close enough by there tomorrow when we redevelop. Because there will be synagogue there and there will be condos there and there will be more housing there and young families are going to want to be near there, especially if their congregation chooses to move there. And the challenge for the city is to create those opportunities that are much more exciting and inviting than a home on a residential street. Because even if you apply for the PCM1 byline, you get it. If your congregation expands, you're going to want to move. So the job of this council, and we're working on it in a parallel process, is to make those places available. Find, rezone existing buildings at the ground floor or above that will allow for religious use and speak with landlords to ensure that they're willing to rent those spaces or to subdivide certain buildings and make them into condo spaces and sell those spaces, to build buildings where people can live on top and go down to the synagogue below, go down to restaurants and other activities below, to have a community life with parks and everything else. And that's what the master plan is all about. So this is a parallel process, but any existing institution that does not take advantage of this opportunity is giving up an opportunity. If they don't get it, they're just no worse off than they are today. The city has the right to shut down any synagogue today. We expect everyone to apply. And at the same time, we as a city have a lot of work to do because in the event that any of them don't get voted in, we better find you places that are better than where you are today. That's our job. Our job is to make sure that if you, okay, like I said, it's not happening overnight. The PCM1 bylaw takes time to get to the time when you can apply. You have so much work to do until you can apply. And then if you don't get it, we're not going to say you have to move tomorrow. We're hopefully going to have a lot of opportunities for you to consider in the event that you don't get your status. But to not take that advantage, that opportunity to get status where you are, who wouldn't do that? I don't even understand the discussion. If the city wanted to shut you down, we would have done that already. So take advantage of this opportunity and realize that we are working very hard at the same time to provide more opportunities for the growing demographic that you spoke of tonight. C'est la responsabilité de notre conseil. Et on va travailler fort. Maintenant, on a une population de 35 000 personnes. Peut-être dans dix ans, avec la construction de, 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 de Carrie Square, le mail Cavendish, le mail de côté luc on va avoir dix mille personnes en plus. Peut-être plus, on ne sait pas, mais on va avoir des services. 
pour toutes ces nouvelles populations, 10 000 personnes, peut-être. On va avoir des synagogues et le tout. That's the master plan. So we're doing our work. Don't miss this opportunity. Do your work. And uh, we'll continue to do ours. But this PCMY process is just a small, it's a small part of the process to ensure that eventually in Cote St. Luke, everyone is safe. And you have to know, and people say, why don't you enforce? We can't enforce safety. I, my opening comment spoke about Jewish principles where we value life. Why did I say that? I said that because I know that the religious community more than anyone else respects those principles and they don't want an accident happening in their, uh, in, in their synagogues. And we as a community would love to be able to enforce safety requirements, but we can't. We can enforce safety requirements only if you're zoned appropriately. Then we could enforce sprinkler systems, emergency exits, ensure the foundation, the floor is strong enough so that if you want to dance and have a good party, that everything's safe and that everybody in there is safe. These are Jewish principles. You all want to be in legal zones. You all want to have legal institutions. It's to your benefit and to the cities. So don't miss this opportunity. And I look at it as an opportunity. Apply. And at the same time, we will do our work at the same time and find better solutions and build a community that's going to service the 10,000 or more people that come to move to Cote St. Luke because we're going to be the best. We're going to continue to be the best. And we're going to be an example for the world as a Jewish community that is 73% Jewish. And of that population, we have a good percentage that are Orthodox. But I didn't say the Orthodox community is a majority of Cote St. Luke, but we're a wonderful Jewish community. So let us make sure that we continue to build it right. Thank you.